got a great turnout today. Like I mentioned, today's discussion will focus on highlighting issues around sustainable building materials. As consumers increasingly recognize the importance and urgency of addressing the environmental threats that humans create, exacerbate, and suffer from, they are increasing the pressure on industries that have the biggest impact on our climate and environment. COVID-19 has exposed critical vulnerabilities in supply chains around the world. And as consumers continue to feel the effects, more people are asking, where are my goods coming from? And what are the implications of that? It may come as a surprise, but most building materials in construction across America are domestic. In fact, single and multifamily residences in the US utilized nearly $95 billion in building products in 2019. Only 6.4% of those were imported from other countries. This isn't meant to underscore the fact that unless commercial transportation can cut emissions at scale, aviation and maritime shipping will account for a large percentage of all carbon emissions by 2050. One thing is for sure, if we don't change course on commerce, we won't change the course on our warming climate. But we can shift our approach and we can intentionally embed sustainable materials processes and systems that contribute to healthier building practices and healthier buildings. Today, we are going to explore sustainability practices in a few different sectors with representation from big business, small business, and the tech industry, discussing what it takes to be sustainably made. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to apologize. One of our original panelists, Jeff Terry from GAF Roofing, was supposed to be joining us today. He unfortunately had a family emergency come up, but in his place, we will have Paul Shariari joining us on short notice. So we really appreciate that, Paul. Although Paul's platform, which you'll hear about today, maintains a database of domestic and internationally sourced sustainable materials, we felt his experience and industry insight would be a welcome addition to our audience today. With that, I would like to introduce the rest of our panelists. Ron, would you like to say hello? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ron Jarvis and Peter, do you want us to talk a little bit about uh, the company at this point or just hello? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, seeing a lot of names that, that I know. So it's great to see everyone. And it's great to know that everyone's still uh, carrying the flag, doing everything we can to make the world a better place through better products. So really, really pleased to be able to be on, on this uh, panel and support South Face. The, the Home Depot, if you look back, 1992 was the first year that we really jumped into sustainability. And we were the first retailer to come out with uh, restrictions around if you had a product that you said was green or better for the environment, you had to have verification, certification, and documentation. So we were the first retailer to do that. And then the Retail Association, Association adopted that in 1994. And then um, 1996, we won the President's Award for Sustainability from President Clinton, back in a time where most people weren't even talking about sustainability. So we've, we've gone down the path of sustainability for a long time. And there's a lot of things that, that we know, a lot of things that we work with industry to make changes that most of the public don't even know happens. In 2007, we set out a eco options program. And for those of you that haven't, you can actually Google Eco Actions Home Depot and see what we have today, where we identify products that have less of an impact on the environment than standard products. But those products all have some type of verification or certification, but we also know that there's a lot of products that do not. So we spend a lot of time working on products that uh, do not have any type of verification or, or certification that we know need to be a little better than they are today. And it's interesting because I was with the merchants a few years ago and I said, let's look at it this way. Let's stop buying green products. Just stop. Now let's go green the products that we buy. And so we started looking deep in the products that didn't have certification, but could have a couple of things made to change the product that would make those products better. So me and my team, we spent a tremendous amount of time looking down the road at products to make sure that we can find products that do have you know, a better environmental impact. Um, one thing that I like to say is we don't like for the customer to have to stand in the aisle and choose between good and evil. We want to always bring the good products and put those out front of the customers. Thanks, Ron. So we're going to hear a lot more about 
uh, Home Depot and some of their sustainability practices and, you know, how they go about selecting the products they put on their shelves that, you know, we bring home. Brian, would you like to say hello? Hey, everybody. Appreciate y'all joining us. Um, <clears throat> I'm Brian Boggs uh, with Brian Boggs Chairmakers. I've been in the business of making chairs initially the a very old way, centuries old way, uh, to learn the craft and have gradually evolved into a very small manufacturer of chairs with a number of craftsmen on the floor. And particularly as we get bigger, sustainability has been a, a bigger question, uh, even though when I started out, it was an of course, we didn't have to think about sustainability. I was buying a log and making a chair out of it and not it wasn't coming from anywhere far away and not going anywhere far away. So sustainability was just a natural part of what was happening like it used to be in our world. And as our company gets bigger, we're starting to see uh, different ways of acquiring material, still very local, uh, still holding the idea that everything should last long enough to replace that material, the trees, but also experimenting with other materials and how they might impact design and make things better, not just because they're sustainable. Uh, products like hemp fiber, linen fiber, uh, we're now looking at rice lumber, uh, lumber made from rice and PVC, and how those things have properties that are different than the woods that I founded our company on. Yet, now that we're becoming more of a design entity, the material selection can enhance, not just replace what we're doing and impact design in a way that that in of itself can become more sustainable. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But very happy to be joining this group. Thank you, Brian. Full disclosure, I did a, a few months time in Brian's shop, built a few <laughs> stools in my life. So uh, just wanted to make sure everybody uh, was above board with everybody, but I'm really glad that Brian and I were able to reconnect and he's able to join us today. Um, they make some beautiful stuff. We'll be sure to drop the link in the chat today so you guys can check out his website. Paul, how are you today? Can you say hello? Great, Paul Shariari with Ecomedes. I'm the founder and chief innovation officer here. Um, I actually started my uh, my green career uh, on lead, actually in the basement of South Face. I was one of the first people in the country to take the lead AP training there, and I became one of the first lead APs right there in the basement of South Face. So I have a lot of uh, love and affection for the work that you guys do. Um, Ecomedes is a technology platform that tries to automate. Uh, all the work I used to do as a consultant in the space for many, many years. I also served as a lead faculty member uh, for, for five years and trained about 15,000 people on the early versions of lead. And a lot of the work that I did as a consultant was always looking for the, the data around the products as an engineer. You know, to me, I look at a building and it's just a bunch of Lego pieces. You know, I'm still a little five-year-old kid loving Legos. But those Legos come with data. They come with performance characteristics about length of, of life. Um, health, wellness, energy star, water mm -hmm. sense, all that stuff. And as I started doing this work as a consultant, I was always just up at night till two, three in the morning building spreadsheets and uh, wanted to get out of that work. And Ecomedes is the largest database of consolidated data to support sustainable decision making for the built environment. So we have 80 different eco label certifications and specification sources that we pull data from uh, dynamically all the time, at least once a month. And then we have over a million products from about 7,500 total brands on the platform at any given moment. And we automate not only the, the raw data that you might need, Energy Star, Water Sense, Green Guard, EPD, HPD, bring all that to you without you having to go out on a lot of scavenger hunts. We also <laughs> automate lead documentation, well documentation, LBC, and federal guidance because our platform is used by the USGBC and the GSA to make their work a little easier because just having the data sometimes isn't enough. You need to know in context why you've gotten it because a building, a home, a residence, a multifamily is a sum of all things. So we try to make that easier for you and really proud to be on the on the call today. Thank you, and Paul. Free, and by the way, it's a free tool for everyone. So there's no, no, no sales pitch today. We'll be sure to drop that link in the in the chat as well. Ron, I don't think we need to drop a link for Home Depot in the chat today. Paul, well, I, I really appreciate you joining us on, uh, on such short notice. I was able to connect with Paul. Um, he works with our facilities manager here at South Face, has in the past, so uh, he was able to connect us, and I'm really happy he was able to hop on today. 
Um, so we are going to get started with our discussion here. You guys did such a great job introducing yourselves. I can just skip the first question. We've pretty much covered our bases there. Um, so let's get into this. Brian, the first question is for you. In a furniture shop like yours, sustainability can take a lot of different forms. Can you expound on that? Sort of like what ways do you integrate sustainable building practices that might not be sort of immediately apparent to you know, people looking at your, at your products? Well, you know, the, the, the list that we consider and, and hold in mind as we make any decision from buying stuff and where our trash is going, the obvious things, is your product, your material coming in from sustainable sources? Are you using electricity efficiently? You know, all those things are, are as you said, on the, on the list that everybody knows about. Something that we look at doing is from a design standpoint, and, and covering two important bases that are important to me regardless of their sustainability aspect, but just from the standpoint of being a good craftsman, uh, I think being a good steward of the earth is in line with that. And that means designing things that will, that are more timeless, that are more basic to humans and not following trend so that they will be popular in 50, 100 years, or at least loved by, the heirs who receive them. The other thing is making them last long enough so that you know if we're going to take a tree down that's that's 80 years old, the furniture needs to last 100 years so that the next tree can grow. And with that, our impact on you know landfill and other things becomes a lot less. And what our what the chairs are actually made of becomes a little bit less from the standpoint of you know, what happens at the landfill when it's discarded? Well, these don't get discarded. So that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. And that's, you know, we're, we're now making chairs and, and other furniture from the grandchildren of the customers that were buying from me 30, 40 years ago. And that's pretty cool that, um, you know, we've got, we've got clients that have been buying from us for 20 and 30 years. You know, eventually they get enough furniture for the house. They love it so much. They buy it for their kids, their grandkids. And so now we have three generations of people that are, that are loving this stuff across generations. And that's kind of proof of the pudding that the designs are outside of trend. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, the, the designs are, are timeless. They, they fit anywhere. Um, there. I, I just really encourage you to go check out the check out the website because um, what what Brian puts together and what comes out of his mind from the the drawing the shop drawing to the little model he makes to you know actualizing it you know a month or so later is it, it's quite the process and uh, a lot of a lot of thought um, and mindfulness goes in, goes into that process. Um, Ron, I'd like to to ask you a question um, about sort of your platform a little. I imagine you've got you know, some vetting processes and things like that um, when it comes time to put products on the shelf at Home Depot. Can you share what that process looks like? Do you have sort of like a minimum requirements list, minimum thresholds that products need to meet? And how does your team make the, the pitch that, hey, this we've got options that are very competitive to our sustainable one, but how do you kind of make that pitch to the people that are making the ultimate decision that, hey, this it's this product that's going on the shelf? Yeah, that's a great question. I could probably spend the rest of the day answering that question. So I will break it down into uh, bite-sized bullet points that, that we can all grasp and understand. Uh, with you know over 2 million SKUs in many industries, we have thousands of touch points across the sustainability realm at <laughs> So what I've been able to do is to break everything down into five categories. So there's five categories that of the thousands of touch points, everything falls into. It's either carbon emissions, chemical exposure, deforestation, which we also include mining, water use. And the fifth one is waste and recycle, which we now call circular economy waste and recycle. So it gets a little easier to manage when you think of five categories instead of 2 million SKUs and you know 200 industries. And then we look across the board at the industries at Home Depot 
uh, deal in that, that we're core. You know, we're core in lumber, we're core in carpet, we're core in paint, we're core in live goods. Uh, people think of Home Depot when they think of buying uh, cabinets or water hose. So we know that those categories, each one of those, we have to understand what the environmental impacts are. And then when we see things that, that either through NGOs or scientists or through our own research, we say, you know, down the road, that could be a problem. How do we change that? And that's what we work on. And if you think we have, I think we have eight, eight categories now that we have a chemical policies for, um, paint, carpet, live goods, uh, vinyl flooring, laminate flooring, insulation, uh, cleaning chemicals. So we've taken a lot of chemicals out of products so the customers don't have to come in and stand in the aisle and try to choose, okay, which ones do I, which ones do I want? When we see the capability of taking them out, we do. The old days of a green product coming in that's better, that's more sustainable, that has less of an impact, and then getting one facing on the shelf and then fighting for two years to try to get more space is pretty much over, at least at Home Depot. We look across the board and when we see something that is better, then we go back to the vendors and say, okay, this is where we wanna go. This is the new product. Um, it has to be the same efficacy. It can't work less or not as good as the other product. It has to be the same price. People are not gonna pay more for green products. So when we went from regular VOCs to low and no VOC paint, price didn't change. We went from regular vinyl flooring to vinyl flooring without orthothylates, price didn't change. Efficacy of the product didn't change. So that's, you, you ask, are there litmus tests that, that they go through? They are, but a lot of that's done in a very high level to where we say, these are the products that we're gonna buy. So if you want, if you're able to manufacture these, then come in. Same thing with you know what Brian goes through with wood. We spend a lot of time looking across the, the global forest at places that we would and would not want to buy wood. And we set standards and regulations around those. Like we're we're the only company that I know that has you know restrictions. At least we were the first ones to come out with restrictions. Uh, no wood in, from the Congo Basin, no wood from the Amazon, no wood from Papua New Guinea or Solomon Island, unless they're FSC certified. And I don't think we have any FSC certified coming out of those regions. Um, I would be a little suspect if we did. So we basically do not buy wood from those regions. So that's, and, and we have, you know, all the different categories um, that we have, and we now probably have a hundred plus merchants. And the good thing about me and my, my background, I've been a merchant or a divisional merchandise manager and MVP for almost every department at Home Depot. So I've, you know, I've been to the factories, you know, I've, I've been to the growers, I've, I've, you know, worked deals together for many, many years. So it helps us as my team starts putting together strategies to remove certain things or pivot inside of an industry that we can go to the suppliers and go to people we know and say, these are the changes that we want to make. Great. So how did you... This might be a silly question. I mean, be, besides like obviously sales numbers, how did you know that you that Home Depot had sort of gained sort of the trust of, of your customer base, you know, through that sort of sustainability um, kind of window? Like we're, you know, this is the track we're going on. Like when, when was it like, okay, this is, this is working for us? Well, it, I won't say, Peter, I won't come out and say that I, I'm 100% convinced that it's working for us now and that we own that market because we don't. Um, and a lot of stuff that we do, we don't even tell the customers. The customers don't even, they didn't know we took out, you know, orthothylates out of vinyl flooring. They don't know that we've got a cleaning chemical policy that goes into effect 2023, um, but we're doing it for them. What, what I hope, what I think of when I'm shopping and I'm determining I'm gonna turn left or I'm gonna turn right into the orange box is that I trust this company they bring the right products, their employees are friendly, knowledgeable, and I read stuff that says, you know, somewhere up and down the supply chain, someone's looking to take care of products, and I trust them to do the right thing. And, you know, it's, it's, we think that the customer, you know, at least the green customer does research before they come into the store. And so they know, you know, I'm looking for a product that's um, this chemical free, or has this certification or uses this amount of energy versus the other. And then we've taken, it's one thing I have found is that the average American consumer is not gonna go out and shop for green. They're not gonna go out and look for a 
energy efficient refrigerator, the average American customer. They're gonna look for the right price that looks like the right color, that has the right size that fits into the hole that they have. As they get it home and they're plugging it up and they look on the back of it and they see that it's Energy Star, they go, way to go Home Depot. I didn't buy it because it was Energy Star, but I sure am glad it is. Uh, most of our refrigerators now are Energy Star. 100% of our toilets are water sense. 100% of our shower heads are water sense. So we don't give the customer the, the option to do bad in those aisles. When you come in, when you buy, we've already made that decision for you. You're not gonna be able to make the decision to buy something that's not Energy Star or not Water Sense if we can take the, the industry there and have the same efficacy and have the same price points. Well, you've convinced me. I'm, I'm done with Lowe's at this point. <laughs> Uh, Paul, similar question. Um, you're not, you know, directly selling these sustainable products, but Ecomedes provides sort of that critical platform for architects and builders to to kind of research those products. So, how did you how did you kind of gain the trust in that industry? And you know, you've got over a million products in your database. How do you go about kind of vetting these? Sort of similar to to what Ron was was talking about. You know, you've got a slightly different business model. So, so what does it take for for you on your end? Yeah, so I, I kind of put on the hat of, you know, me looking for stuff for our clients back in the days when I was a consultant is, you know, you had to find products that were lead compliant, well compliant, living building challenge compliant, earthcraft compliant, uh, name the, the standard that says the building itself is green, you know, you got to go down that ingredient level. And just like Ron said, you know, we have energy and water, circularity, human health as like big guiding stars. But within that, I trust that Energy Star is going to give me the right energy use consumption data and it's third party verified or water sense for water consumption and EPDs for LCA data or an HPD for health product disclosure. So what we set out to do is we, we looked at the buyer side of the market and said, where's the big pain point there? And it's, it's hard to do it. Like we've been talking a little bit on the pre-call, like it's hard to go find a greenhouse. It's hard to go find, you know, enough things. It's, it's not that hard to find a green product within a certain category with a certain viewpoint, but when you start saying an entire house or an entire remodel, you're talking about in a house's case, maybe 250 unique items. That's a lot of work. So we've set out to do is say, what if that research was automated? What if that wasn't where we paid a lot of money? A lot of consultants time is spent looking for the products, looking for the ingredients to make a really nice burrito for the sake of an example. And then when I looked at the manufacturers that I'd done work with, they said, we don't get credit for all the great stuff we've done. We've chamber tested our stuff. We don't get materials from these bad parts. We don't have any conflict minerals. We have a great supply chain. So it was kind of a two-sided marketplace problem. The buyers said they couldn't find the data they needed to make data-driven decisions. And the manufacturers, like, we've done all these certifications. We want to get credit for them with our buyers. And in the middle, in construction, we have architects, engineers, contractors, consultants that are this kind of influencer layer. They spend the owner's money and they spec things that are from a certain manufacturer and we saw that as a great opportunity so we gather data from 80 different eco label certifications and, and specification bodies put it all together let you find it quickly in whatever category you care about and then if you need to analyze that one product or a kit of products against lead living building challenge well you know so we're always referencing a third party either a third party rating system for a building or a third party eco label for a product and then we right now are focused on just giving you that data to then say, this is the right brand to buy from. We are right now in this year kind of expanding how to send people to where to buy. So our manufacturer clients have a where to buy certainty, where to buy St. Gabon, where to buy Kohler, where to buy. We would love to work with you know retailers and distributors like Ron and say, hey, you know what? It's available at the Home Depot right now. Go buy it. And I think that's the, that's the big unlock we're looking for this year is to help people do what they said they were going to do and not let them kind of fall off because finding a product right now available has become a challenge for construction. That is, you know, there are houses that are, can't be sealed because they can't get an air handler. There are garage door shortages in Florida because people can't get that and they can't get a CO for a house. So uh, hopefully the Home Depot can help people actually buy the green stuff on the shelf. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, my next question is kind of for everybody. So if we can just kind of, we'll go in the round, we'll go Brian, Ron, Paul. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it doesn't need repeating, but COVID-19 has affected supply chains worldwide. Has this hurt your ability to source sustainable products versus maybe products that aren't as sustainable? What, how has you know this 
era we're living in af affected our ability to continue on this sort of sustainability track? And, you know, how have you had to think creatively to kind of navigate these times? If you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Brian. Um, there you go. You know, we, we certainly felt the pain of COVID, but not from a supply chain standpoint. Our, our wood comes from 20 minute drive down the road. Uh, some of it now comes from as far away as Pennsylvania. We have imported mahogany from Honduras through a sustainable process that we, we are directly involved in. But our last container we bought from them was a couple of years ago. We were due to buy another one, but it was really Honduran politics, not COVID, that caused that uh, source to disintegrate or the organization that, that gets it to us disintegrated. So, you know, except for, you know, Blum drawer glides from Germany, you know, now we buy them from uh, an American supplier. It's, it just hasn't hurt us because of how we've always supplied things, which has been as close to Asheville as we can. So we, we've avoided that, but, you know, we, we had people six. We've, you know, we've suffered from the great resignation like most companies have, um, <clears throat> but not supply chain so much. So how do you, how are you sourcing your, your local hardwoods? What, like, are you, what kind of, how, how are you building those relationships? I know you're not just going to the hardware <laughs> store and, you know, I do not go to the hardware that's store a, and buy in maple and, and that's a well worded question because a company of our size, you know, we've got, we've got 10 employees, including myself in the whole company. We're, we're a tiny, tiny buyer. And the logs that we need are largely getting shipped to very big veneer manufacturers, or they're getting shipped overseas. Some of the best ones are going to Germany, Italy, China. And, you know, our, our vendor, our, the source is just down the road. And for the most part, I don't even get to walk on the log yard because we're just too small. If I don't call ahead and say I'm buying for such and such a company, they'll kick me off the lot. I don't even get a conversation. Hmm. Um, I actually bribed uh, a log broker uh, gave, by giving them a chair years ago and we became friends. And now I call them up and, or they'll call me up when they have a special log. But we can buy in the cracks too. Sometimes they'll have one or two veneer logs or big walnut logs. Their buyers need a container load. Well, these need to move because it's summer and the logs are going to go bad. So they'll call us and we'll buy it. So that relationship uh, you know, going out there and talking fishing and mushroom hunting and all the things that, that really do build a relationship are real critical in this industry. And if, if they don't like you, I mean, I've, I've heard them tell stories and I've had situations I've seen myself, if they don't like you, you're out. It doesn't matter what your wallet is. If you tick them off, it's, it's a very old fashioned uh, culture and environment. Um, less so with the vendor in Pennsylvania, but I just, you know, went up and we, he was already splitting bat blanks out for baseball bat manufacturing. So clearly new wood from a straight grain standpoint, which is rare in our industry. So we connected really well on that, on that vein, but it is really important for a company our size to gain the respect of a vendor in the timber industry to be able to purchase at the point that we purchase from the law. Now, otherwise we're buying retail lumber. And that's just not going to work for what we do. We, we have to create our lumber to get wood that's processed in a way that allows us to do what we do. Conventional lumber doesn't do that. So the relationships are absolutely key. And to, to expound on that a little, when, <clears throat> when Brian is, is mentioning sort of the, you know, we can't, he can't go to the standard lumber yard um, because Brian talked about design and, and the thoughtfulness in that design. You know, he, he's worried about things all the way down to like, what direction is the grain going on this armrest? It needs to be flowing the right way because it has to, it's got to look a certain way to have that feel. Um, and that, that's why Brian can't kind of go to these standard places. He's got to take it from the log, recognize the grain pattern, understand what's happening in order to mill it the correct way for, you know, whatever piece of furniture it is. And that process starts long before the furniture is, is built. Yeah, and you know, we take a log apart the way a good butcher takes a chicken apart. 
you don't just run a chicken through a saw and slice it up into pieces. You take the thigh off, you take the leg off, you take the wings off, you fillet the breast, and you present it in a way that each part of the chicken can be cooked in the recipe that that piece of meat is best for. So we dissect a log more than just chop it up. And I imagine that leads to a far more yield out of the log than, than otherwise. More yield and um, more importantly, very specifically oriented to what it's going to become. Mm -hmm. Thank so you, we Brian. design based on the anatomy of the tree. Yeah. That's kind of, that's, that's a sort of a natural design kind of, kind of element, mimicking, mimicking nature. Um, that, that's a sustainable practice. Uh, Ron, oh, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> oh, it's just what we used to do. You know, we, we've mm -hmm. done that for centuries. Yeah. Ron, um, same, same question, COVID-19 and supply chains and Home Depot, where, how, how is it, how have the last two years gone for you and how has it been different than, than the years before? Uh, it's the supply chain since March of 2020. It's a tale of two stories. The first story, tremendous amount of people working remote and everyone cocooning March 13th, 14th, 15th, saying we're all going remote and sales dropping dramatically to the point to where, you know, as a company, we were looking at it and saying, how far down can sales go before we start having to lay people off? And then you get into a, <clears throat> you don't want to lay people off during a pandemic. So, um, so we actually pulled back on some of our inventory uh, through March. And I noticed because I'd worked for 35 years going in every day, coming home late. And all of a sudden, you know, I was here and that screen door did squeak or I did need to paint the mailbox or I did need to coat the driveway. And since I was working at home, I could do that for lunch or I could do it after work instead of commuting. And so did everyone else. And so our sales went from double digit negative to double digit positive about the same week that the stimulus checks hit. And, um, we couldn't keep things on the shelf. Even though we had restriction on how many people come in the store, how far you could stay apart from each other, uh, did a tremendous amount. It, it pushed us on the, the dot com and the last mile quick delivery pickup at store. It pushed us forward about five years in four months. Wow. So it was good for us. I mean, it, it made us a much better company. And the supply chain at that point was pretty sparse because of the demand was so high. And so we've been fighting that ever since. And we did have, you know, due to COVID, we did have, because we're, we're a global company, we buy globally. So we'd watch as COVID went through China and the factories shut down and, you know, our products were not manufactured. Then it happened in Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea, you know, certain parts of Europe, Mexico, but we know we would keep, and, and like most companies, there's a certain amount of inventory that you keep on hand at all times. And then there's a certain amount of inventory you keep in your distribution centers and distributors. So there was some leeway in there to pick up, you know, if there were any downtime as far as shipping goes. So COVID did affect our supply chain. It still is today. There's a, there's an outbreak right now happening in South Korea. So, you know, we monitor anything coming out of there to see, you know, what, what's, what's it going to do to the supply chain slow down. Uh, everyone knows shipping, trucking, uh, shortage in all of those industries. And so it's, 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 it's two, tell of two stories. One, COVID did create some hiccups in the beginning, but um, today it's supply and demand and getting products out and, you know, having enough on the shelves and all the people that are moving and the ones that didn't move are improving their homes. All the people are now working remote, adding on another office. Uh, remodeling their downstairs. So there's just a lot of remodeling and building going on right now. So did you see differences in the sort of your international supply chain versus your domestic supply chain during that time? Yes, you do have, you know, especially when we had like the port of Long Beach and, you know, the backups that we had there when there were 80 ships waiting to be unloaded coming in. So anything that was coming in did have extra lead times. Um, you did see some of that with domestic if they couldn't get a truck under it to, to move it. And so it's, it affects both domestic and international. 
but of course, domestic headaches are much smaller than international because uh, you can find the truck or you can move it yourself or there's a lot of things you can do domestically to get the product. Did Home Depot make, um, make adjustments? Did you say like, okay, like, okay, we're not going to source these products internationally. Did you look for domestic avenues to source this? Um, the supply chain for a company like Home Depot is extremely complex and the infrastructure is, is built and solid. Uh, we do have some categories that we can move around from international to domestic. Uh, but the majority of them, we did not. Um, but, you know, there are a couple that we would do domestic, but most okay. of it international that stayed international. Gotcha. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Paul, um, so you, I'm sure during, during this era, you've talked to suppliers and manufacturers as you're um, trying to get all the, the right information onto your platform. What was their... What were those conversations like? Where was there a lot of worry? I mean, obviously there was worry, but you know, how did that affect your, you know, your business model and your platform and, and what it is you were trying to do? Yeah, great question. So I think you know we we are an all digital platform. What we did is basically, like I said, automate a lot of the consulting. That's this kind of middleware of I'm looking for data. I got to evaluate the data. I've documented what I want to specify. And now I'm going to go buy it somewhere. So. What COVID did to our world is actually shift a lot of the workflows that used to be done by reps coming into see architects or see builders, all that shifted to digital. And as Ron mentioned, I think what would have happened probably naturally over the course of maybe a 10 year cycle happened in about seven months, right? Everyone's like, I can't go visit my customers anymore, but I still need to build projects. I'm buying lots of stuff or I'm selling lots of stuff. So the shift to digital kind of find, analyze, report and document happened very quickly and we were already a digital platform. So that really helped us and gave us an advantage. During that same time, the rise of ESG has become a big deal to investors and buyers and institutions. So that kind of helped us because we have all this data that you know at its base level rolls up to an ESG type of report. And a huge drive towards transparency happened also while we were kind of in our, in our home offices, doing our work, trying to figure out how to balance all the things of running a family, having kids at home, someone's sick, what, what if someone's sick, not seeing family. So kind of the rise of, of COVID kind of shifted a lot of people to go and do things digitally, which certainly helped us. But then it actually showcased that the supply chain that we're involved with is like, does the product have the data that I need? Can I do the analysis and documentation in like minutes, as opposed to having a couple of design cycles to go through that. And what kind of came out of that is a lot of manufacturers started putting in their zip codes of where things were manufactured to like showcase that they were made in the United States, made domestically, or at least in, in the US and Canada. And then a lot of them actually started putting tags on their product IDs that said quick ship available, or these are our average lead times. And the manufacturer that like really quickly shifted, um, it became apparent that they wanted to be in a leadership position and not like having customer service trying to man calls that you know they couldn't answer because they didn't have the data. Another little anecdote too is that a lot of the, the customer service people were starting to answer questions like, well, if I needed to buy this much, do I need to pre-order and like stage the drywall my project because I don't want to be at a point where now I got to put you know something over those metal studs and not have it. So it's been kind of very interesting to see how people are using quick ship available, more data, made in America compliant, and the EO that just came out of the Biden administration around things like buy clean, which is an EPD, you know, or an LCA on a product or PFOS free. Those are going to really rise up, I think, the, the ranking of digital workflows that make us be more sustainable without having to do all that hard cognitive uh, work that it takes to build a sustainable building. Great. Um, Ron and Paul, question for you. And I, th I think our audience would really like to know. Um, so how do you, how do they know? Obviously, you know, you look at, you look at a label and it, it, you know, it says, you know, this is a green product or an eco product, but those sorts of things can, can make those sorts of, you know, terms can make it on a lot of labels. So what sort of particular certifications, what things should our audience be looking for as they're in stores, they're buying things? Um, you know, what, what should be those sort of like top sustainability kind of, you know, keywords, certifications, um, you know, what should they be looking for as they're, as they're buying? Some of the key attributes. Ron, do you wanna, you wanna give this one a shot? Sure, and as I stated before, it, it depends. It depends on what their environmental attributes concerns are. Um, 
as we look across the board at our impacts, you know, our impacts from being a business, from buying products and selling products, if you list it and say, okay, the, the top three are carbon emissions, chemical exposure, and deforestation, which water and recycling is important. But if you just take those top three and say, okay, I want to I want to reduce carbon emissions. So what do I, what do I do? And you look at the product categories, you look for, for any type of labeling. What, what I do, and I've spent many, many hours researching what Home Depot's baseline impacts are. What are the product categories? What are the industries? Which industries have the biggest carbon emissions? We even study you know, the, the, the carbon emissions from a kilowatt hour by zip code through the e-grid. So we know that if a customer buys a, a, a refrigerator or a dishwasher, in Vancouver versus St. Louis versus Atlanta, we know what that impact is over a year and what are the carbon emissions based off of the grid that, they, that they're that they using. So we, you know, we, we look at this and say, how can we reduce those impacts? We even break it down into our product category. So we know over the lifetime of a product category, which product category has the largest emissions. And you know, for a company like Home Depot, it's probably you know, light bulbs. And what have we done with light bulbs? Well, we were one of the first retailers to take incandescents off the shelves and really push, you know, CFLs than LEDs. And the technology that we're pushing behind the LEDs, we're saying that's what we're going to offer. So it's going to be extremely difficult to come into Home Depot and buy a light bulb that's not already energy efficiency. Same thing with paint. I mean, we went from very interesting story. We had, um, you know, we had regular VOC paints. And we decided to go to low and no VOC paints because we thought it was just a healthier product. We thought the efficacy was there and the customers would never know the difference. They just got a better product. So we pushed our vendors to move to that with you know a little bit of pushback and hesitancy, but they went there. And then all of a sudden in 18 months, we transitioned every single store at Home Depot. So when you come in now, you're buying low VOC and no VOC paints. Now, do customers know that? Um, most of them do not. And uh, to the ones that, that care, that research it, yeah, they find out and they come in and they buy all the paint they want and it's low VOC and it's not priced up or marked up any because it's a better green product. So when a customer's coming in looking, we hope that we've done that. Uh, again, I ask everyone to go to Eco Options and Eco Actions and look at what type of information we have out there because we know that you know our impacts, the products that we buy, a lot of that is in the manufacturing and the shipping of the product, but other is in the use of the product. Uh, this is new news for probably everyone on this call. We now have 50 stores, 50 stores across America that we have taken out all gas powered lawn equipment. So you cannot go in and buy a chainsaw or a lawnmower or a leaf blower or a trimmer that is gas powered. It is all electric. And we think that that's where the industry is going. We think we have the technology now that when someone comes in, they can buy an electric lawnmower and it you know, will last three hours. Most people don't spend more than three hours mowing their lawn. And the efficacy of the product is just as strong, cuts just as great. And then it's so much cleaner. Americans spill about 18 million gallons of gas a year just filling up lawn equipment. So we go electric, all that's gone. You, you don't have an option. Now we're going to get a lot of pushback from people saying, you know, that's, I want the, the power. I want the, I want to feel like when I've got something in my hands and I can rip through this log. Well, I do a lot of yard work and I do a lot of chainsaw use as well. And the electrical power, the battery operated chainsaws that we have, I've taken them and cut through a 20 inch oak log just as easy as I could guess. So we're, we're taking the public there. Um, we look at those emissions. Those are huge emissions. It's a lot of people don't know. You crank up a lawnmower that's like five years old, the emissions from that equal the emissions of, I think the number seven Ford Raptors. So you crank up a lawnmower, you've got to line up seven Ford Raptors beside it to match the carbon emissions coming from that lawnmower. So is switching that lawnmower to electric the right thing to do? Yes. Now we have to work on the grid. We green the grid once you green the products and all of a sudden we can have some tremendous reductions in carbon emissions. Wow, that's phenomenal leadership from Home Depot. I, I, I did not know that. That is um, that's astounding. So fifty stores. There's not a there's not a gas lawn tool in the in the place. Wow. 
Uh, Paul, so what, what sort of kind of like certifications and qualifications are you, what, what would you say that our audience needs to be looking for, you know, as they're perusing either your site or, you know, an aisle at any hardware store? Yeah, uh, so the way that we look at it is, is very similar to what Ron just said is you can kind of think of Ecomedes and, and the platforms called products.ecomedes.com. I put that in chat. It is like a, a Whole Foods for green building materials and products. So every certification that's referenced by the federal government or LEED, well, LBC, you know, all those 80 or so uh, eco label standards and eco labels. We brought all that data in for you. We've gone to those registries and mapped those APIs. We pull that data in. So we allow the user to define what they care about. If you were to click on one of our product catalog elements, like say flooring, what you'll see in one click is it'll show you on the left-hand navigation, every eco label that we have about flooring. So you can see how many have EPDs, HPDs, floor score, green label plus. I mean, unfortunately we have a logo, a plethora of logos in, in the world. I think there's like 450 active eco logos um, available to us in the United States just to be be better consumers. What we said is that's a lot of noise. Let's just bring them all together and then show you how many manufacturers have achieved some of these certifications in every one of them. So some people go in and say, I only want to see things around circularity. So I'm going to use cradle to cradle as a litmus test and I'll find all the product category leaders in those. Alternately, you can say, I want to see what's available in flooring and then see who's got uh, not only four score and resilient, you know, but then also maybe an EPD or an HPD on, on transparency. Um, we believe that our platform is that kind of what, what Ron said is you can't get onto our Ecomedes platform unless you've met one or more dimensions of green. And the analogy that I use is green buying is like a Rubik's cube. If you've remembered those, there's six sides of the Rubik's cube, but nine little tiles. Sometimes finding a green product is like playing with a Rubik's cube. You might have a good story around circularity, you have a good story about it made in America, but maybe they haven't yet done an HPD because that industry just hasn't gone down that route yet. So very rarely will you find a product that has all six sides solved, but it's our job to make that Rubik's Cube at least more, more plausible for a normal human being to be able to build it. And I think if the analogy holds, you know, these new kids that can do it with their eyes closed in like 14 seconds, that's what our AI and our machine learning algorithms do every day for you. You can actually go into our platform and say, I'm working on a lead project. I need something that's going to comply with materials and resource credit number four. And we will literally within three clicks show you everything that we've scoured the market for as an unbelievable starting point for you as a project owner. And we want to make you guys the hero of our story. We're like, uh, I always say, we're like Alfred and Batman or Q and James Bond. We make the tool to make you guys the heroes because ultimately it's you buying that product or specifying that product and putting it into a project. And just like Ron said, that time you don't buy that gas lawnmower, there's seven Raptors that aren't on the grid anymore. You know, you buy that better light bulb, you don't have to deal with incandescent. So it's those little small purchases done by millions of people. And what I applaud Ron and always have is every day, he probably touches several hundred thousand consumers that are making a better choice because of eco options or eco impact. And that's what we just got to do at scale to get sustainability to where I think it needs to go. Great, thank you, Paul. That was quite the call to action. I was gonna ask you for one of those later, but uh, maybe we'll just have you repeat. Um, Brian, we're, we just got a couple more questions here before we get into our audience Q&A. But uh, for a small business, Brian, I mean, Ron, might, Ron may beg to differ at Home Depot, but it's kind of the preconceived notion that sustainability often comes at a cost. There's usually a, a greater cost implied there. So how do you balance sort of sometimes the slimmer margins of a small business, but still kind of staying true to your, you know, your sustainability measures and what you're trying to do as a small business? You're gonna to need to unmute, Brian. There you go. Um, you know, that, that is, a, that is a, a reality in, in any company's consideration about going green. But it doesn't always cost more. Um, in fact, the way we buy our timber, we're, we're getting, the, for the caliber of wood that we get, it doesn't cost more. In fact, actually, we couldn't get it any other way. But um, buying green versus not green, it's really not a consideration of cost. In our, in our work, the material cost is single digits as a percentage, you know, five to 8% generally. 
uh, we, we try to buy as green as we can, and that doesn't generally impact the cost of the product itself or our margin. Uh, there are things that, we, that we've done, you know, LED lights in the shop, that was huge. That saved us a lot of money. One piece of equipment that we replaced a couple of years ago dropped our energy bill by $500 a month. You know, and, and it cost us, the, the lease on that equipment cost us $350 a month. So there's a lot of ways that bust the myth of green costs more. And uh, it's not that hard to find them. You know, we can't buy much of what we use at Home Depot because it's, it's highly specialized. I wish we could, but uh, we actually do shop there for our, our sheet goods, but, um, yeah, it's, it's really more the way we do things that is easier for us to access a green thing. What we make doesn't come to us in certification. I mean, FSC could certify the lumber, but it's too hard to get what we want through FSC uh, sources. We, we have had FSC certifications a couple of times in our history. And what we found was that when we're trying to explain to people what FSC is, we're learning that they haven't done a really good job of becoming a household name so that people understand uh, the whole idea about a third party certification. You know, I remember a conversation with a guy standing in my gallery with a Starbucks cup in his hand and the FSC label was right there on the cup and he'd never heard of FSC before. It was in his hand, you know, so it was our integrity as a company that was legitimizing how we do things, how we get things, and where our stuff goes when we're done with it. And I think that, you know, the label of green is very important. I think the certification of products is extremely important. The work that Ron and um, Paul are doing is fabulous. A lot of what we do is outside of that because of our size and because of what we're building and how we're building it isn't generally supported by certified sources. So we just have to learn about the companies we buy from and look at how we can get green material without impacting our margin. And it's, it is doable. Mm -hmm. Cause it sounds like a, it's more, it's more like your, your processes and, and some of your sort of intrinsic values the way you go about doing things is what kind of makes, makes up your sustainability mission. It's what helps us do less damage to the planet. Mm -hmm. That's hey, great. Peter, if I could just to- Go, go ahead, Ron. For Brian, and I used to be the lumber merchant for Home Depot and for Lowe's. So I've been in every forest in the world almost. For Brian to sell FSC certified wood, it would probably be the worst thing he could do for his customers because he would have to go out and pay more for probably the exact same wood and he's getting it from some of the most sustainable forests in the world. And so I look at a company like Brian who says, you know, I'm not 100% FSC. Then I look at it and go, okay, then he knows his business. He knows what he's talking about. Now, if he was getting wood from Papua New Guinea or the Amazon or someplace that was an endangered region, he would probably carry FSC. So for him not to have FSC, a lot of people on the call need to understand that's probably a good thing. He, Thank he you, Ron. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate that. All right. So we are coming towards the end of this session. Um, Ron, I, I have a question for you because you've, you've mentioned it a couple times as far as um, your eco options page, your eco actions page. Um, and are you really, does Home Depot really just kind of rely on the products on the shelves to educate its consumers, its customers? Like how do you, it, it just doesn't seem like there's much like, we want to tell you guys we're doing this. Is it more like our actions are speaking for us? And it's, Peter, that's, we look at this in 2007 when we rolled out Eco Options. And we've changed the name over the past year from Eco Options to Eco Actions because we think it's more now about actions instead of options. We're, we're reducing the options um, for all the right reasons because you don't have the option of the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in 2007, you did because we were pushing, you know, products that no one had heard about onto the shelf that were, you know, less impact on the environment. 
And we took a process at that time and said, let's educate our associates so they can educate the consumers. And we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars educating the orange apron. Now look around the next time you go into a Home Depot store and say, okay, who in here looks like that their only job is to go look for a green product. And the average American consumer, if they have that mindset, they usually do the research before they go into the store. And most people have, and I hate to harp on this one more time, but most people have one or two attributes that they're concerned about. They're, they want everything organic, or they only want to buy FSC certified wood, or there's something else that they're after. And for us, you know, there's thousands of environmental touch points. So we can't just say, you know, there's one thing that we're going to rely on. And, you know, we can't say, all right, we want all the store to be Green Guard gold, and then everything will be good because that doesn't work because there's so many different attributes. So the reason that we put eco actions out there is so customers could go educate themselves if they were concerned about, you know, certain categories and certain products. And um, so it's, you know, we would, and the thing about, you know, our offices in Atlanta on Paces Ferry Road, and we have, you know, regular times, we have hundreds of suppliers come in every week pitching product. And nowadays, I've watched this transition happen over the last probably 10 years. Almost every single product that comes in has some type of environmental claim. It's, you know, it's not wood. It's not plastic. It makes the sky bluer. It's uh, no formaldehydes. Well, it never had any formaldehydes. So when you look at that, you've got to be careful because you'll be looking at certifications that really doesn't apply to that product. So, so when we look at them, we go, you know, do we want to educate everybody on all that? No, what I suggest customers do is educate yourself, understand what the environmental impacts are that you want to change, and then learn how your product selection can change that. And if it's a product that is less energy, less water, you know, fewer chemicals, chances are, um, Home Depot has it. And if we don't have it, you can go through Paul to find out where it is. Great. Great. Well, I'm going to consider that your call to action, Ron. Paul, Paul's already had his call to action. Brian, do you have a call to action for our, our participants today? Any, any words you'd like to, before we get to our Q&A session? You're, you're muted again, Brian. My lips are moving and I'm not being there you, heard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that considering the longevity of what you're purchasing, considering its design from the standpoint of how does it really serve its function and what, what will happen in 50 years to this product from a furniture standpoint, I, you know, these other guys can talk about other appliances and things like that, but there's a lot of, uh, furniture to choose from out in the world. There's no shortage of it right now, but where's the furniture going to go when you're done with it? And are your kids going to want it? You know, so buying things that have that in, enduring appearance, you know, durability. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear the dogs? I'm not that's sure. That's the shop that, dog. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's my thing. It's, there, there are a lot of small manufacturers around, and there's some larger manufacturers that make things that are built from that perspective, that it's an enduring legacy left that has a lot to do with how sustainable buying furniture can be. Because we've all gone into IKEA mode. And we know how long that lasts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I would at this point, that was a great conversation, guys. I really appreciate all the insight and uh, feedback we got. Um, but I'd like to open, open it to questions. So if, uh, if you participants would like to enter your questions into the chat box, um, Davis and Tricia and Spencer will kind of Look through them and, and send me the ones. And if they're doubled up, we might we might combine some. But you know, go ahead and, and get your questions in there, and we'll we'll try our best to get as many answered as we can. And uh, pl please let us know if you're if you're asking the question of a you know, specific panelist. Um, just let us know if you'd like us to tee up Ron, Brian, or Paul.
Uh, Michael asked, I love the comment by Ron um, on greening the grid. Would Home Depot speak to Georgia PSC to green the grid here where its HQ is? Um, Ron, do you have any, any comments on that? Um, I'm impressed that someone thinks that we have that much power. I would love to have that much power <laughs> and I would. Um, I have had conversations with the PSC. I've had conversations with uh, you know Southern Company. I've uh, been to Plant Shear. Uh, I've looked at the grid and what we have coming into it. The you know the good news and it's all a lot of um, negativity around the grid, but the grid's definitely getting greener. As it gre getting greener fast enough, not for everyone. I mean, it needs to happen so much faster, but it is definitely getting greener. Um, we would love to be able to buy green energy. And the thing about leverage and the carrot and the stick, um, you need to have leverage. So I don't have another options for plugs or energy when, I, when we build a store or when I do something in my home to plug something in. Um, so you can't go to your local utility, whether you're in California, Connecticut, or Georgia, and say, if you don't do this, I'm going to go somewhere else because there's, there's nowhere else. Now, can we have conversations and continue to have conversations? Yes, we do. And, um, you know, the great news is the grid is getting cleaner, not clean enough for all of us fast enough, but it is getting cleaner. Great, thanks, Ron. Um, this question is from Henry, if anybody wants to, to comment. Are you familiar with the climate actions that the House passed last fall and that the Senate almost passed? Any, Congress, uh, any comments on what you'd like to see Congress do? Um, in any future legislation around um, sustainable building material and just the building industry in general. Yeah, I'll be happy to comment. So we, uh, the, the GSA is one of our clients. We have a platform customized just for federal buyers. Uh, we put all of the data that we had in our platform and we actually curated down to what's called the GPC, the green procurement compilation that the G GSA runs. It's all the federal buying guides for over 700 product categories. We've automated as much of that as possible. Uh, what I would love Congress to do is just to actually enforce the rules that they already have in place, the federal acquisition regulations. I mean, Energy Star has to be for all laptops, all appliances. Flooring has to have lots of different certifications for off-gassing. They have recycled content requirements. I think there's a lot of rules on the books. I don't think there's uh, very many carrots or sticks being deployed. I don't like sticks at all. I think a large carrot with enough length and enough girth uh, could be used as a stick, uh, but I'd rather be like giving everyone organic lollipops. Like, let's reward the people that are buying the right stuff during a federal um, symposium I got to attend in DC. They said, if we only bought the things we were already supposed to buy it with Energy Star at a base minimum, the federal government would save $300 million a year on energy costs. If they bought the top performing category leaders of Energy Star, again, all things that they're already buying, but they bought the top 25%, the most efficient, it would save a billion dollars in energy. So if that's not a good ROI to follow the, their own rules, um, I don't know what else is. So if you could get your congressman to just deploy the, the stuff that already exists on the books, we'd be buying a lot better, greener stuff. And, I, and I, I'll, I'll put in the chat the actual website of all those rules. It's probably the best organized set of rules for product categories I've ever seen from any public or private sector uh, leader. So I'll put that in the chat right now. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, this question is for Ron um, regarding eco claims that vendors use that aren't applicable to products. How do you train or educate your buying team to recognize those quote unquote greenwashing claims? So one thing that we ask, and we keep the green team um, when Arthur Blank uh, and Pat Farah pus first put together the green team in 1999 and, and 2000 to to you know, orchestrate this through the company. They asked me, because I was the person they hired at the time, to, to, to tell them how big the department should be. And I said, it should be extremely small. I said, we should be just two to three people, which were three people today, that kind of gives direction to the merchants. We don't want to have a green merchant buying one product and another merchant doing the other. Whoever's a subject matter expert inside the company has to be the sustainability leader, the green leader. So, uh, we lean on them to educate themselves to know. Now, most of the small green claims, you know, it's plastic free or it's formaldehyde free. Those are very small claims that are not um, 
you know, the reason that either the merchant or the consumer would buy the product. It's just a small print on the back of something. If it's a big claim, like, you know, energy free, um, no chemicals, things like that, we put those through much more scrutiny. Great. Thanks, Ron. Brian, a question for you. Um, how can you be sure that furniture is built to last? Is the only option to source from independent furniture sellers? Just make sure to unmute yourself. Brian, go ahead and unmute yourself. Let me do this unmute thing, sorry. Um, <clears throat> th that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know how someone buying furniture would know that that particular thing is going to last other than uh, making that judgment based on the integrity of the company itself. You know, when as we look at potentially having our my designs manufactured by another company, that is a great concern of mine. The quality control, the, the glues used, how the glues applied, how things are clamped, moisture content and the thing. There are so many uh, beyond design of the product. There are so many ways that quality can get screwed up in the process of manufacturing that you're entirely relying on the integrity of the company to hold every quality checkpoint along the way uh, to a standard. And, you know, fortunately we do have some good companies in the United States. Um, you know, I think Stickley, Moser, our company is a good one. Um, you know, Hickory Chair makes some good products. So depending on what level you're wanting to, to buy, there's a, there are a lot of options from the standpoint of durability uh, in this country, and I, and, but it's always at the high end. There, there's not much inexpensive, durable stuff, unless it's steel or aluminum. Wood products are challenging and um, it, it takes everybody involved every step of the way to make sure that the quality is held there. And, and that's, um, that's the art of making furniture in some ways. It's, it's, the art of fine manufacturing is what we work at mastering. And uh, we're not alone there, but we're all at the top of the market. Uh, otherwise, you know, steel and aluminum are good options, but there's still uh, quite a few furniture companies of integrity in this country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of the experiences I've had um, with furniture you know, that has been built for me and things like that is, what is it, um, it lasting forever doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't need upkeep and repair. If you've done shaker tape um, on a chair, you know, that that might need to be repaired in 20 or 30 years, um, that netting. But the chair is built in a way that it makes that process easy. And it's almost part of that process. Right, Brian? It, it is. But I've gotten away from uh, chairs like that for that very reason. And, and okay. try to make chairs that have the least amount of repair required down the road that is possible in a wooden form. And I don't know how to do, with each of our designs, I, I don't know how we could possibly do better than we're doing. It's every one of them is so thought through and our joinery is, uh, you know, it, it's just there to, to stay. And, so I think with what we make, there's, you know, finish is going to need to be touched up down the road, but that's, you know, shipping can damage things, but in, in normal use, there shouldn't be repairs in the life of the thing. Great. Uh, one last optional question, um, or if anybody wants to wants to speak to it, <laughs> how does the environmental cost of shipping factor into the assessment of how sustainable a product is. So, you know, at what point, you know, you're, you've talked about, you know, the, the chemical impacts or um, the, you know, the water impacts, the carbon impacts, but when do you kind of, when does the, the shipping part of that come into the equation? I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, the shipping part for the U.S., 29, 29 to 30% of all our carbon emissions, the man-made carbon emissions in the US comes from transportation. 
So you have to look at that. And of that 29%, 58% of that comes from small cars and pickups. So maybe Uber delivery now would be a small part of shipping for products, but it's still a small part. And then you look at the heavy trucks and trains, you know, you're probably looking from 12 to 14% of that 29%. That would be the shipping part. And when you get into planes and to boats, I think boats are shipping maritimes, what, less than 3%, planes are about 10%. So you look at it and go, okay, how big of an impact is that versus the product itself? What is the impact of the product? I think you have to look at it both ways. At Home Depot, we're attacking those on two different <clears throat> platforms, one being transportation. Uh, I track every year the carbon emissions from our transportation, whether it's on boats or trucks or rail cars, whatever it is. And then we look at that to see how we can reduce that year over year. Um, the great news is we've reduced it dramatically in the past 10 years by route optimization, cube utilization. Um, we have, in the past month, I've had meetings, I've had meetings this week with the largest uh, truck shippers in America. And we talk about you know, what it takes to electrify transportation. If you get a greener grid, a better grid, electrify transportation, we reduce our carbon emissions dramatically. So how do you get there? Well, the great news about the trucking industry, which is probably the biggest for the domestic uh, emissions, their inventory is about you know, 18 to 24 months from transition because they drive those trucks so much that a truck lasts about 24 months at the most. So if we came out with the perfect battery truck, within 24 months, we changed the whole industry. Compare that to the maritime and the shipping where the ships last 30 to 35 years. So they come out with a better new ship. A lot of people are gonna wait till the old one's worn out before they switch over. So we have conversations with shipping companies and trucking companies. What are you doing to get better engines? And we have those conversations all the time. Great. Thanks, Ron. I want to note that in our database, you can find manufacturing location uh, by, by city and zip code, and people can actually calculate how many miles things are being made. So I definitely think that Ron said it the right way. There's, there's embodied energy and in what the product was cradle to gate. And then once it leaves that gate, you can actually calculate how many miles away, like the old league credit did for 500 miles. But I think people are getting a little bit more refined on how is it going? Is it going by rail? Is it going by car? So the base data is there. But I think we, we definitely need to see this uh, evolve over time of, of how much that data really matters as opposed to some of the other characteristics of a product. So the data is there, just you got to figure out who really cares about it and will that change a spec from one brand to another or one distributor to another. Gotcha. Thanks, Paul. Well, questions are slowing down. That was a wonderful conversation. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, our panelists that could join us today and uh, our participants that also joined us with some great questions and interaction in the chat. Um, we will be having another start in either May or June will be our quarter two, end of May, early June. Um, and we're looking at a few different topics for that, but uh, be on the lookout for um, updates from South Face. And once again, we appreciate everybody joining us today. Panelists, do you have any parting words? Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, thanks Brian. Thank you, Ron.